Hi. Hey, how are you? Great. It's so nice to meet you. Oh my gosh, you've got on the cool shades. Uh love them. They're so cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um I would love to, you know, I'll probably do a beef introduction and everything for you and um then I'll um talk a little bit about we have a new resource so I kind of wanted to mention that while we're live if that's okay. Sure. Um with the whole place and um yeah, and then we'll get started. I know it's um for some reason my clock is like a few minutes behind. It says Oh, okay. So we've got a minute or so. Can you yeah, hear me so well, Brian? I hear you well. How, can you hear me well? Yeah, I can hear you well. Yeah, everything looks pretty good. The lighting looks great. Um, yeah, so far everything's looking good. So great. This is so exciting. Thank you for having the time to um, meet with me, like with old ways in general for this. My pleasure. You know, I'm always singing in the praises of old ways. Yeah, I'm always singing the praises of always and brilliant work that you guys are doing. So um, thank you for having me. You know, you're seeming a little blurry. Um, and I'm using the... If I use the... Um, I, I was using actually the cellular service instead of Wi-Fi. So I was seeing if the Wi-Fi would um, improve the quality. Yeah. But you're very blurry. I'm blurry. Oh my gosh, I see you very clear. So let me double check. Blur it out a little bit or? How am I looking are, on your end? You are blurry, but um, I don't know. People that they are blurry to us. So are we both blurry? Oh, ah, we're Sarah. Yes, Sarah, you are blurry. I'm the blurry one. Okay. <laughs> I think it has something probably to do. Let me, maybe I should connect with my Wi Fi then, real quick, and maybe that will help with the blurriness. You look less um, blurry now, to, make... to be clear. You're, you're, you're less blurry? blurry than you were, for sure. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Wi-Fi has not been the best, but um, I appreciate everyone for joining. Thank you so much for your patience um, and tuning in for this conversation with Bryant Terry. Um, you know, I would love to introduce myself real quick. I'm the curriculum coordinator with uh, Old Ways for a Taste of African Heritage and a Taste of Latin American Heritage. Um, one of our new products that we have coming up for our new project will be our launching of a Taste of African Heritage e-course. So please feel free to um, keep up to date with that. It will be um, launching in December, and it's so exciting because um, anyone and everyone will be able to, um, you know, sign up and participate in a Taste of African Heritage, um, you know, class series. So be stay in tune on our website. But um, yeah, thank you all for joining. So now I'm gonna introduce Brian. I see you see him here on the lower screen, looking awesome with his cool shades. <laughs> so um, yes, Brian Terry, what is he? He is amazing, you know, he's a cookbook author. He's, you know, the current chef in residence for the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. He is a NAACP award-winning chef. He's the editor-in-chief of Four Color Books. He's a J Spirit Award winning um, Leadership Award recipient for Food Justice. He has also made uh, really cool appearances on national television like Good Morning America and CBS. And I could just go on and on about this man because, you know, we are obviously a fan. <laughs> we have like a lot of his books. So thank you so much, Brian, for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on. As I was mentioning earlier, I'm always 
singing the praises of old ways and talking about heritage diets and um, directing people to come to the site so that they can um, use the important resources that you guys have developed. Yes, and um, before we even get started, we also have you featured in our curriculum under our recommended reading list. We have um, Afro Vegan Black Food, all, all three of your books. You have much more than that, but um, we, we also sing praise of you, whether you know it or not. Um, we're big fans of Old Ways also. So Thank you. let's get started. Um, you know, one thing I'd love to say about Black Food is um, you did a beautiful job in illustrating how health is more about, you know, just the food that we eat. And I was curious, why is it, um, why was it important that you expand this project beyond the scope of, you know, a traditional cookbook? You know, because when within Black Food, you have poetry, a music playlist, um, you know, and various <laughs> other elements of culture. So why was that important on expanding on that? Yeah, so um, I'm speaking loudly because Amanda, my creative director, said she can't hear me well. So if I'm oh, too I loud, can, can then just tell me to be quiet. <laughs> but, um, you know, it really, I mean, the important thing, I, we can't talk about Black food and we, unless we talk about we, what I argue is its precursor, which is the residency that I've had at uh, MOAD, the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco, since 2015. And in that position, I create public programming and so much of, you know, the book, I would say, you know, the kind of embryonic stage of the book was actually the programs that we created at the museum. And literally there are chapters in the book that are directly pulled from the names of the program, like the Land Liberation and Food Justice, the Black Women Food and Power, Black Queer Food. These are IRL programs that I did where we brought, you know, activists, scholars, um, chefs, poets, creative people to come and talk about these issues. And so, you know, that's one part of it. Um, but, you know, this book, well, what was the question you asked me? Because I want to make sure I'm like, I, I can like, a I can answer 15 questions that might, I might think be, would be the subtext of the question, but what was the actual question you asked? Yeah, no, no, you're along the right lines. It was, you know, what was important that you expanded on this, you know, from making it like a typical cookbook to even more than that. Like, one thing that I quoted a lot while reading this book is, um, you know, it's almost like a book that happens to have recipes in it. You know, like there's so much more than, you know, just like your typical cookbook. And so I thought that was really cool. And I want to know, you know, what was important that you draw from that when creating this? Oh, yeah. OK, yeah, yeah. No. So when I when you first asked that question, one thing that I thought about is how mm -hmm. I'm often encouraging people because when we too often when we talk about what's helpful, I think there's a lot of emphasis on nutrients and micronutrients. And obviously, you know, those things are important in, th in terms of having a, a kind of diverse whole foods diet, right? And one of the criteria that I um, am constantly encouraging people to include when we think about what's a helpful diet or what are, their, what are our ancestral foods? You know, what are the foods that our grandmother mm -hmm. and, and, and her mother and her mother, what were they eating? And how did that not just sustain them, but how did it help them thrive? And so that's why I'm so excited about the work that um, you all do, because you're really, you know, putting that into practice and creating these like guides for people. So I can't really write a book, I, you know, in terms of like thinking about this expansive idea of Black food, you know, I really couldn't write a book that just looked at food. I mean, when we, I mean, look, mm -hmm. the idea of food in this book, it's the multiple meanings of food. It's not just the kind of nourishment and physical sustenance, but what are the ways we bring fed intellectually and spiritually? And I really wanted to tap on all those um, different areas within the, pro the book project. And so, you know, largely inspired by my residency in Moad, it does have fine art. Um, pieces that open each chapter. You know, I actually um, um, commissioned and in some case licensed pieces from different artists to open oh. up each chapter and visually encapsulate mm -hmm. the content. 
um, they're riveting essays by scholars and activists and journalists and, you know, just brilliant people throughout the Black diaspora. And recipes are a through line. And I want people cooking uh, from this book. I really hope that this inspires people to have it in their kitchen. And I know that a lot of people have it at their nightstand and they'll be reading the essays and the poetry. I know many people will see it and people, you know, email me weekly about the way in which they see this as this precious object that sits on their coffee table and they really want people to just like meditate on the um, visuals. So there's a little something um, for everyone in Black food. And the thing that I love about a book like this is that maybe you do come for the recipes. Maybe you're just like, I want to cook. You know, I'm really mm -hmm. invested in practicing making African diasporic recipes. And then you find your way to the essays. Or maybe you're just like, this is a, a beautiful book. I love the cover. I love the, the artwork. I love the storytelling and the food photography. And then I don't cook a lot. I hope that you would pivot and actually try some of the recipes. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm excited that it just gives people um, the opportunity to, like, take things in on multiple levels. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. It really offers, um, you know, so much for such a wide range of, you know, readers. So, you know, whether you're in the kitchen or whether you are more in the books, it really has all of that in there. Um, one question I asked is, you know, while you were putting together Black Food, were there any dishes that were actually like new to you or surprised you in particular, um, you know, featured in the book? Um, I mean, look, I'll say that one of the recipes, not that it surprised me because I knew who was making the recipe and I knew that his uh, culinary brilliance and craft, I knew that the recipe was going to be brilliant. But um, mm -hmm. I will say in terms of like the recipe that I keep coming back to and that I really look at as one of the uh, ones that I, I think people are going to just be surprised and, and find themselves making their way to it. It's the um, the blueberry cheesecake. It's a oh vegan my gosh, blueberry yes. cheesecake mm -hmm. by Malcolm Livingston the, um, second. Who's it's this, so uh, pretty. Yes. Brother. Yeah. I mean, look, the, 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 the cake is delicious, you know. Jillian I love that Johnson. we both have the books in front of us and <laughs> just like flipping through. <laughs> our, our food stylist, Lillian Kang, our uh, prop stylist, Jillian Knox, our food photographer, Oriana Corin, they did such a beautiful job just capturing the brilliance sure of this did. recipe. Yeah, so um, it's, that's one, it's certainly one of my favorite recipes in the book. And I feel like it's one of those recipes for people who are skeptical about plant-based eating. If you bring mm -hmm. this to the table and, you know, don't feel that you need to announce that it's the vegan dish that I'm bringing. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's yeah. Where, you know, people will dive in and then when you reveal that it's vegan, they're like, oh, maybe, maybe I, I can try some more of this plant-based stuff because I didn't know it was happening like this. It was popping like this. So, um, yeah, that, I mean, but that's just one among dozens of recipes in this book that I love. Um, I want to give a big shout out to Elle Simone, who is on staff at America's Test Kitchen as um, both a food stylist and on-screen talent and producer. Um, we were lucky enough to have Elle test the recipes in this book and ensure that they um, you know, were executed beautifully, written well, and that they work. And so um, big up to her and her team for really making sure that the recipe shined. That is awesome. Yeah, um, there's so many points that I want to pull from that, but it also kind of goes into the next question. So I'll go into the next question first. Um, we, one thing that we really enjoyed was um, you have this recipe. It's on page 78, and it's the Dirty South Hot Tamale. Um, it was really cool reading yeah. about, you know, African-American tamale making in the Mississippi Delta in the earliest 20th century. And um, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit, you know, you were talking about plant-based. So I guess, you know, how, you know, typically I'm from the South. So when I think about tamales and stuff, it's like full pork chicken or just like, you know, um, you know, a cheese. But you use jackfruit. You incorporated that. So I was curious, you know, why did you use jackfruit? And, you know, like how did you, um, you know, change from, you know, how your family was making it? Yeah, I mean, my family wasn't making them. It was, um, I, when I think about- It was a neighbor. Uh, what food memories. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. just thinking about food memories as a child. And definitely one of my, my favorite food memories is 
going to uh, the, we called him the tamale man, which was the brother, the older brother who would sell these hot tamales out of his heated food cart uh, in South Memphis, the neighborhood that my dad grew up in. And so, you know, just remembering how special it was for us to go over and, you know, we'd get tamales that we'd take back to my my uh, mother and sister, but then we would often uh, buy an extra one that we would share in the car, sitting on the hood of the car and just talking and just having, you know, guy time. So, you know, in terms of sweet memories with my dad, that's certainly one of the, uh, my favorites. But yeah, I didn't, you know, these tamales, these unctuous, just delicious, fatty, beef mm -hmm. or pork filled tamales that we would have. I mean, they were just, it was like one of the best things in the world. And when I think about it, I literally, I, I can feel, I can taste it in my mouth, but um, I had no idea about this larger context of uh, tamale making in the Mississippi Delta among people of African descent. And there are a lot of theories about, you know, how those connections happen and how, um, you know, that uh, culinary knowledge and cooking knowledge was passed on um, from Mexicans to Black folks. But um, the way that I found out, I actually read this um, really good oral history that this um, woman did for the Southern Foodways Alliance. So if you if you want to know more yes. about mm -hmm. that history, you should definitely look up uh, the essay that she wrote. But the 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 flip for me, and and to be clear, you know, I know that jackfruit, uh, green jackfruit, is kind of ubiquitous now as a meat replacement in plant-based mm -hmm. cooking um but i never used it i like i it, whatever like up until this recipe i really did not cook with plant of uh, jackfruit i had eaten it before when i went to different vegan restaurants but i i just mm -hmm. kind of intentionally didn't cook it and part of it uh goes back to my approach since i started um you know writing cookbooks is that I really want to encourage people to have more of a whole foods, plant-based diet. You could be a vegan, you could eat, you have a diet devoid of any animal products, and it could just be a, a horrible uh, processed food filled, uh, junk food filled, fast food filled vegan diet. And and mm -hmm. I don't know if that. I mean, yeah. So you may be benefiting the environment, or you know, certainly like for ethical reasons. You know, I understand why. I, I can make arguments all day about why we should have a vegan diet for ethical reasons, for environmental reasons, for economic mm -hmm. reasons. Um, but in terms of health reasons, it gets a little tricky when people who just kind of adopt a vegan diet, but aren't necessarily adopting a whole foods plant centered diet. And that's what mm -hmm. I want to encourage people. to. And I understand that, you know, if you're transitioning from the standard American diet, to a vegan diet that sometimes those meat analogs make sense. If you're just eating burgers every day, then fine, I get it. Like, you know, some mm -hmm. of those Franken burgers, like impossible <laughs> or, you know, yeah. or, you know Beyond Burger. And not to single them out. I think it's it's bigger than them as companies. It's more about this kind of culture of, mm -hmm. um, you know, multinational corporations trying to make a quick buck off of um, market trends. And so I'm, I'm not invested in market trends. I'm invested in improving public health. I'm invested in people feeling better and feeding themselves well and growing food and, you know, contributing to the local economy and supporting small farmers who are growing food with integrity and with concern for human health and the earth and all that. So, you know, all that to say, that's a very secure, I'm taking a very circuitous route to get to the point that, you know, the jackfruit thing, I'm like, whatever, it's just another, like, meat analog, eat some legumes, eat some you know, nuts and seeds, mm -hmm. like forget all that <laughs> stuff. But with this one, I, I did feel like it would be fun experimenting with the jackfruit because I wanted it to have that texture that yeah. I um, you know, was used to with the tamales that I grew up eating. And so uh, I, I tapped uh, my colleague and friend, Karina Rivera, who is um, Afro-Latinx and is a expert tamale maker. And we developed the recipe together um, we use grits instead of uh, masa, which is typical to use in tamales. And um, for the meat, you know, for the filling to give us kind mm -hmm. of flavor and mouthfeel of uh, the ones that I grew up eating, we use the green jackfruit and they turn out beautifully. And, um, you know, the, the, the pièce de résistance of the, the recipe is actually mm -hmm. the cilantro sauce that you drizzle on yes. top. You, you got to mm -hmm. make sure you have a, a Every bite needs to have some of that cilantro sauce in there, and you'll be the better for it. So, 
Absolutely. I feel like I feel like we all kind of have our own like happy tamale kind of memories. Like, and I definitely agree with the cilantro sauce. Like, um, yeah, I would love. Ah, I wish we had more time. <laughs> but yes, I have a very happy memory with tamales also. And I know what you mean by that cilantro sauce. That is really the cherry on top for like anyone who's having tamales don't have it without that sauce <laughs> it really makes the it makes the dish like it's amazing um mm-hmm. one of the things we read it was it was an interview that you did with the washington post and you were speaking on um one of the poems it was black god in the gumbo kitchen it's on page 94 yeah. um you were you're were saying that that was one of your favorite poems and i remember when i was reading the book i was kind of going across it and um, I was curious, what was your interpretation on Michael Lena's writing? And what did this poem mean to you? You know, like, it's, it's kind of um, short and sweet, but I feel like it has a lot of underlining meaning. And it's on page 94. Let me show the audience. Yeah, um, Black God in the Gumbo Kitchen. Yeah. Um, page 94 in Black Food. Yeah, it's like uh, this one. This was yeah. written by, yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, this was written by um, Michael Otiano Molina, one of my closest friends. We were undergrads together. And um, uh, somebody somebody writes, the jackfruit is good because it's from the earth, not lab created. Yes, thank you. I totally agree. Look, just to get back on those um, lab created uh, Franken foods, as I call them. You know, I- I'll say this. One of the things that I-, I definitely take issue with the lack of transparency with these type of um, food tech companies that often don't give us a full understanding of what we're actually eating. It's like, okay, sure, like this is some new thing, but what is it? Like, can I get a the ingredient list? Can I know what? Yeah, I'm I want the I'm raw hiding? ingredients. Yeah, you know, they <laughs> often hide behind um, the the fact that it's proprietary. Um, so that's the whole thing. But I'll I'll tell you this: what bothers me. I won't even say more than anything, but something that really bothers me about the ascendancy of these type of like fake burgers um, is the fact that there are restaurants that I went to a decade ago, uh, like vegetarian and vegan restaurants, that would do these really creative, uh, interesting, um, you know, real food burgers using vegetables and grains Mm -hmm. and legumes. And they would be just inventive and delicious and they're using whole foods and now i go back to to many of these restaurants and, and other restaurants that um you know might have had these house-made burgers on the menu and they no longer do because they have cool. the beyond burger or mm-hmm. the burger. and so i just feel like these type of products that ultimately you know they're enriching the shareholders of these corporations they aren't really invested in public health they don't have any real stake in addressing labor or environmental issues so they're about money i mean and and that's the bottom line we've seen it before we know like i think that we we've done the rodeo and seen what silicon valley is really about and it's increasing profits for their shareholders period um if they can find a way to do that that taps into um contemporary market demands, then of course they're gonna create these products, but they don't really care if we're sick or dying, they care about if they're getting paid. And so, <laughs> you know, I, I I just, I hate that we as eaters are robbed of the creativity of chefs um, in, in favor of these very uncreative um, food products that um, are marketed uh, to us as something that's, you know, taking us into the future. And in many ways, I feel like they're taking us backward. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I mean, kind of sticking to that topic, when you're thinking about like the prices that they're coming out with for some of these like so-called healthy foods, um, you know, like these vegan burgers and stuff, it's like, why is it so costly? You know, like it's not even telling you the natural ingredients that are in it. You know, it's frozen and prepackaged and it only comes with maybe two burgers per package. So it's like, that's not going to feed a family that barely feeds an individual. And, you know, it's so, it's kind of like, you know, just, it's it's a bad feeling. (laughs) You don't even, I don't feel so healthy, you know, like when I'm partaking in that, because it's like, this is kind of the same thing as like the fast food or, you know, it's kind of like, 
a take a knockoff of that. And so it's like, it, how is this sustainable? You know, like, how is this still giving my body the nutrients that it needs? How can I be assured of that? It's not like I'm, you know, going out to the farmers market and getting the produce myself. It's more like, you know, I'm following this uh, famous vegan brand or whatnot and purchasing their overly priced products that are like not accessible right. to people in the community who genuinely would you know, need more access to those things, but just all of us in general. So it's yeah. Just... Well, well, sorry, so I, I felt like you were going to say that. something. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that um, point about um, the cost, because I do think that these type of products reinforce this idea that having a plant-centered or vegan diet is cost prohibitive, you know? <laughs> I, look, these are products that are marketed towards affluent people. Whenever I go and buy one of these burgers, I'm not spending less than 20 bucks. You know what I mean? And so no. I just think about the this because, you know, there's the, the, the way that we imagine eating vegan being very expensive. And I think often it's a lot of a very kind of narrow way of thinking about how to maintain a diet like this. But then there's a reality that so many of the products that are marketed are very expensive, which brings me to the point that we don't need to rely on these multinational corporations and these um, corporate owned health food stores to address food insecurity. Look, every neighborhood, every community deserves a full service supermarket because we know that mm -hmm. communities that have um, a, a plethora of you know, let's take West Oakland, California, for example. When I first moved to Oakland from Brooklyn, um, I was living on um, in an apartment building a couple blocks away from Lake Merritt, which is this beautiful natural body of water adjacent to downtown Oakland. And like downstairs at, you know, whatever, one of the corner stores was now a gentrified corner store. And so they had like lots <laughs> of organic, they had organic greens, they had you know, bulk legumes and grains. So it was just like whatever I needed in a pinch, I could go down and get it. And then, you know, maybe a quarter mile around the lake, you're at this brand new Whole Foods back in 2008. It was just built. Um, and whatever, they have what Whole Foods has. They have like subpar produce. Uh, they have a decent overpriced wine selection. And they have a lot of processed and packaged crap that they market as vegan. Um, you know, it, 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 when I think about the problems, because I do think that there's a role that business can play in helping to create a more healthful and just and sustainable food system. But my mm -hmm. problem is with the reality that we have a handful of multinational food corporations that largely control our food system. And that's a problem because the, the food system should be something that the people own and the people can control. And when you have such mm -hmm. entrenched corporate power, what can they do? They get to determine the prices of products that the consumers buy. They get to determine what's even available. I mean, the fact that we only have like access to a couple of varieties of apples when there are over a hundred varieties just a century ago. They, as I mentioned earlier, have no real stake in addressing labor issues in addressing um, environmental issues and addressing public health. So the problem is that there's too much power of corporations that control our food system and so we, we have to take back the food system. But anyway, point is, there's a whole food there. <laughs> there was <laughs> around the lake, if you go around a little further, there's a, um, the Grand Lake Farmers Market where there are lots of local, uh, organic and sustainable farmers, a diversity of fruits, vegetables, grains, like just great food. And then they have like, you know, prepared food. So it's a great family spot where you right. can gather and build community at the farmers market. But then if you were to go, maybe, I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes in the opposite direction of um, the Whole Foods, you'd be in West Oakland, California. Back in 2008, West Oakland, California, they did a study and there were 53 corner stores and liquor stores in that community and not one single supermarket. Now, trust me, I don't argue, I don't think that supermarkets are the cornerstone of food security. I think that mm -hmm. every community should have them because the reality is in, in communities like West Oakland back then and, and even now to a certain extent, these corner stores and liquor stores are where many of the denizens are um, having their food needs met. And, you know, there's the reality of these stores obviously having what they have, which are, you know, lots of processed and packaged foods, cigarettes, mm -hmm. 
So, you know, tobacco, yep. alcohol. So, Candy, just, yeah. you know, and just like you see them on every corner. This is like that adage. You, you see a black corner. What do they say? You see like a, a church on every corner in a, a black neighborhood. And then, uh, you know, I would argue that across the street, you probably see one of these corner stores and liquor stores. So to add injury to insult, the products that they carry in these corner stores and liquor stores in the hood, the same items that you find there, they're double the price that you find in a conventional supermarket. My, yes. So, you know, we do need our, 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 we do need markets in our community and you have like the people's community market, which is now, uh, a, a, you know, a independently owned supermarket in West Oakland that had actually created a model where people can invest, individuals can invest into it. So that it has more of a community ownership model. And so mm -hmm. they're there, but you know, whatever there are a lot of people in that community and, and and maybe there's a maybe they need another store but i guess the, the the point i'm making is that we need to be thinking about addressing these systemic issues and not having band-aid solutions and you know a whole foods in a neighborhood or even you know a walmart with organic products in a neighborhood that isn't the solution to community food insecurity because the, the reality is you can't look at um, lack of access to healthy fresh affordable food in a vacuum and and mm -hmm. when we look at many of the communities that have very little access to healthy fresh affordable food these are the same communities that have crumbling infrastructure these are the same communities that have underfunded um, segregated public schools. These are the same communities that are dealing with environmental racism and um, industries that are poisoning the air and the water and the soil. And so lack of access to healthy, affordable, and fresh food is simply one indicator of material deprivation. We need to address a range of issues, and that's why we need to have an activist mindset and not just be about like, oh, I'm going to go and get me some um, vegan burger. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, sure. <laughs> They're, they're fun. I just like I literally just had uh, one of those uh, Beyond Burgers like five weeks ago. The one of my um, events for my book events, they had like impossible sliders and it was fine. I mean, whatever. If I'm out somewhere and I'm having some wine and someone offered me an impossible slider, I'd probably eat it. But um, I, I just want us to think bigger and think about how we can use our, our um, voice as not just consumers, but also community members and citizens to actually transform the realities and um, you know, all of our communities, not just my community, because if I'm not well, I'm part of a, a bigger system. I'm part of a, mm -hmm. you know, I'm one part of a whole. And if I'm, if things aren't well over there, then I'm not well over here. I can pretend like it, you know, maybe I'm well for a little bit, but ultimately I'm not well. We need to think about how can we holistically heal our neighborhoods, our communities, our, you know, country. Absolutely. And I mean, like several points on that. I mean, you have a lot of, um, not a lot, but there are community gardens that are being put in place or, you know, like the same old like food markets that they have going on, um, you know, in predominant minority areas. And um, for instance, in Boston, we have this Matapan like food market and it's amazing. Like you go to it and they even give you like a coupon voucher. It's like, a dollar off and it's like local owned like people in their gardens who are bringing their fresh produce there where you can purchase it and I would love to see more of that just everywhere in general um, because you know there's nothing better than like kind of going being able to go directly to the farmer or directly to the person who has the produce and ask the questions need be you know like when you're going to the grocery store you know, you may think it's local and then you see the label on the backhand side and it says, you know, shipped from China or shipped from somewhere else. And there's definitely something connecting when you know that something, um, you know, that your produce, you're getting it locally and, you know, that you're actually like feeding into the local economy in that way also. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of setting a present. So I think that's really important. So somebody um, writes, corner stores are very helpful for seniors and working families. Well, I mean, sure, ideally, if they actually provided products that were helpful and um, that, you know, allowed people to make home cooked meals. But the reality is we know most of these corner stores and these um, in, in communities, especially working class and working poor communities of color, they're replete with processed and packaged foods, the type of, you know, they're not even food. They're what Michael Pollan calls edible food like substances. They're, you know, high in fat and high in salt and high in sugar. And they certainly don't have the, the nutrients that, um, you know, I mean, all of us, but specifically young people, young people who, you know, developing brains and, and 
um, bodies. But I think that, you know, it, it speaks to the point for me that um, beyond many of the changes that I, I mentioned in terms of consumer action, really being mindful mm -hmm. about how we spend our dollars, because yeah, every dollar we spend is a vote for the type of food system that we want to see. When you make the decision to go spend your dollar at a Walmart or some of these corporate owned stores, as Malcolm X said in one of his speeches, at the end of the day, that man takes that bag of money back to his community. And ideally, dollars should continue to recirculate in our communities. Economists call it the multiplier effect. And we know so often in these type of low-income, working-class, working-poor communities, as soon as money comes in, it goes right out to these multinational corporations. And so we need to be having these locally-owned food sources. But um, I think that what 2020 showed me, and, and I, I think a lot of people, is that we can't depend on late stage capitalism to save us. We can't depend on the, the US government to save us. And I'm talking about everybody. I mean, if we look at the inept response to um, the pandemic, then it's clear that they don't care about most of us, except for the ruling class. And if, you know, as the old Negro adage um, says, if America has a cold, then Black folks have pneumonia. And so we know if, in general, if these um, systems aren't supporting just us, everyone, as a kind of like body of citizens, then it's definitely not going to be looking out for those on the margins, those who have historically been, um, you know, erased and, and marginalized and not taken care of. So what I am most excited about are people who are taking things in their own hands and creating, you know, institutions that will support us. You know, I think about Fannie Lou Hamer and the um, over 600 acres of land that she bought in the South where she was, you know, creating farms and gardens and teaching people how to cook mm -hmm. and creating, um, you know, housing and really moving beyond just the the kind of, because people hear Fannie Lou Hamer and they're like, oh yeah, the, the, the kind of, voting rights activists. So the, the person who was kind of encouraging us to get more involved, um, and, you know, and, and use our political power. And that's only a part of our story. The other part is this un, unknown, less uh, just talked about history that um, Dr. Monica White, who is a professor um, at the University of Madison, Wisconsin, she contributed an essay to Black Food where she talks about this history. And so I think about, you know, groups like Project, Project um, Jackson in um, Jackson, Mississippi, I mean, I, there, there are a number of organizations that I've been uh, learning about who are creating these alternative systems. And I think we need to look at groups who have this intersectional analysis that understand the ways in which we need to be creating these parallel systems and that there, there's no disconnected, like there's so many interconnections that we need to think about when we're talking about food and, and going beyond just food. You know, if you think about like, I think about... Um, Movement Generation, uh, a group based in Berkeley, California, that's doing some really brilliant work. Climate change is the focus, but you can't talk about climate change without talking about like what food we're growing, how we're growing it, you know, all these issues. But then even Black Lives Matter, you know, Black Lives Matter, um, we've let the propaganda from the right um, and the corporate media that tends to vilify them, you know, create this very misinformed understanding of the, the the brilliant approach that the organization is trying to have in terms of not just talking about like police violence. And, you know, if you think about like the inspiration of my work and many food justice activists, we were inspired by the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense and their Free Breakfast for Children program and their grocery mm -hmm. giveaways. But why did they start? They started because they were addressing police violence in Oakland, California. They were policing the police because as police do now, Back in the 60s, they were violating the rights of Black citizens. They were killing them. And so the Black Panthers emerged out of this, um, you know, this, this moment where they need the police to police. And we see that that's a problem that persists now. But then they also understood that there are a range of issues that we need to address in these communities. And that's why they started their survival programs. And they had their free breakfast for children program. Mm -hmm. And they had sickle cell anemia. To the person's point about like seniors and older people, they had cars that transported people to the market so that they can get food and could take people to, you know, um, hospitals for their, or their doctor's appointments. And so, you know, going back to Black Lives Matter, if you look at their platform and their position paper, they're talking about police violence, but they're also talking about 
food justice. They're encouraging us to rethink our relationship with land and energy and, you know, really doubling down on this emergency of climate chaos and the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. They are recognizing that the origins of modern day capitalism are rooted in the institution of slavery and we need to have conversations about reparations. So I, I'm, I'm done with these folks that just want to talk about food and, and don't, or let me just say this, people who just, I'm just going to talk about people who just want to talk about veganism, who want to talk about vegan burgers and, you know, the new cookbook and, you know, all this crap but they don't want to talk about social justice. They don't want to talk about like humans being like, yeah, I believe that non-human animals should not have to exist in an industrialized food system where they have to deal with the violence, um, the violence that we know they have. I mean, that's all beef by Boogie Down Productions was the, 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 the thing that woke me up to the violence in our industrialized food system. And mm -hmm. if you're not talking about the violence against, um, you know, many of our marginalized neighbors, our brothers and sisters who are being violated and br brutalized economically. I mean, we can talk about like the kind of like immediate um, physical violence that we see, you know, by the hands of the state. But when we talk about things like environmental racism, when we talk about things like food insecurity, that's what um, the Princeton professor, uh, what is his name? Look at my, uh, slow violence. That's slow violence. That's not the type of mm -hmm. dramatic violence that you might see on the TV, but the US going into third world countries and destabilizing governments, the US not caring about citizens enough to create public policies that prevent industries that are gonna poison the air and the water and the soil, that's violence, it's slow violence. So miss me with all this stuff about vegan eating if you aren't talking about all these structural inequalities that impact all of us. I'm a little fired up as you can tell. <laughs> No, no, I love it, though. I mean, that's something definitely that I think like goes in hand in hand. Like if you're reading this book, you're not just going to be hearing about veganism and plant based eating. I mean, I think that's what kind of you start that conversation in all of your books, but definitely in black food, um, from the poetry and the readings, it definitely talks about structural underlying structuralized issues. But what I do like is that um, the book solely doesn't focus on oppression. It also focuses on the good things of the culture and, you know, the positive aspects. So um, one, I would like to say thank you because you don't see that often, <laughs> um, you know, when you're talking about um, black culture, you know, it can be a lot of oppression focused and it's understandable because there is a lot to address within that. But then also there are plenty of beautiful things that come out of that, that, um, you know, it's good that we also shine a lot, a light on like the positive aspects of. Um, and and I'm glad you mentioned it. that. I'm glad you brought that up because um, I was very intentional about this book having that tone. When I reached out to the more than 100 contributors or potential contributors, I shared this quote about um, that Toni Morrison, where she talks about the uh, racism being a distraction. And I really encourage people to think about this book as one that you know, I, I wanted people's, the, the energy behind their recipes, their essays, their poetry, whatever they contributed, I wanted it to be about our brilliance, our agency, our magic, our joy, our creativity, because there are, like you said, we, we, we get too much of that. I feel like it's, it's weird poverty porn. You know, I don't want to hear about mm -hmm. that. We know that story. You can't talk about our story around food, history, culture, or anything else without recognizing the, these realities and you know, I, I, I know the way that we create a different world by dreaming of a different world, by envisioning a new world. And so I wanted this book about like historically talking about these best practices, about people envisioning something different and manifesting it. And I really want us to be moved so that we can create a new vision for what these systems look like. And then we can actually move towards that and manifest it. So um, that's, you know, I'm really proud that when people talk about this book, they talk about just, I mean, whatever, like their first interaction with the cover and how much joy that brings them, seeing how colorful mm -hmm. and bright it is. But even with the content, you know, people really feeling mm -hmm. like it just, it, it leaves them inspired. It leaves them excited about um, being a part of the movement and not just feeling helpless and like, you know, there's nothing to do. Yeah, absolutely. So um, 
Yeah, that was honestly something very much appreciated. I guess on a lighter topic, um, I love what we're talking about, though. I love the rant that you're going on because it really focuses, um, it, it opens a whole nother conversation on, you know, sustainability and food activism because, you know, not a lot of people, I think, think about that, um, you know, because there are food deserts out there. There are, um, you know, minorities being um, displaced, you know, versus access to fresh produce and so that's something to definitely take into consideration and that's why I say like you know definitely support your local farmers shop local you know like um think about the way you're eating mindfully but also you know how you're contributing to the local economy so you know I think that's something that you know t traditional like you know food activists think about but I think also um when even I'm reading you know a cookbook or you know there's always the personal consumer, you know, like you have to see yourself as how you're participating in, you know, climate crisis season, um, you know, how you're actively contributing to the problem, but also how you're working towards the solution. So um, this is a really good conversation. Um, I did have some other questions on the book and I know you, you may be tired of talking about it. Can I, can I ask these questions or is it all right to go for it? Okay. Cause I mean, I, I, I love what we're talking about, <laughs> <laughs> but the book is what's necessary though. You know, like that's all I care about. <laughs> well, you too, you who wrote it, but like, yeah, we, we care about the book. <laughs> no, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> um, one of the questions that I had, and it was kind of like a fun one. Um, it was on page 27 by Adrian Miller. He talks about the cookout and kind of distinguishes the difference between a barbecue and a cookout. When I saw that, I was like, yes, someone said it, it's written, we have this, like, this is beautiful. Um, and it was talking about, you know, uh, with barbecue, you've got the larger portions, usually the meats are slowly cooked, whereas, you know, with a cookout, it's small, conventional, and intimate. You know, those are the three things that kind of pop up in my head. Um, what is something, you know, which one would you prefer to host and why? Like, if you had a chance to host one, I don't know, next month or so, which one would you prefer and why would you? Yeah, <laughs> well, um, it's been a while since I read the essay, but just for the people who haven't read it, to give you a quick synopsis, uh, Adrian Miller, our brilliant uh, public food scholar in um, Denver, uh, he writes about the difference between cookouts and barbecues. And, you know, simply put, cookouts are less formal. They tend to be impromptu. Uh, oftentimes, rather than the host making the whole meal, they might make kind of an anchor dish and then other people will bring dishes. So it's more potluck style. And then he goes into this brilliant history of barbecues, which, you know, frankly, I didn't know about it. And I was just like, mm -hmm. and that's why there's so many gems in this book. Um, I'm, I'm very excited. There have been over a dozen professors who've emailed me and let me know that they've added Black food uh, to their uh, spring syllabus. Um, oh, nice. and so I'm glad that, you know, it's being used in colleges as a tool. But um, barbecues, you know, they, they go back, they, 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 whatever, it's a long history, but they, they tend to be more of a public spectacle. Um, historically, it was African Americans who did a lot of the labor to prepare for the barbecue in terms of like making the pits and gathering whatever needs to be prepared. And then like, you know, feeding white people. And then afterward, then like the, the enslaved Africans or, uh, you know, the, the folks who prepare at the barbecue, then they might get a chance to eat. So, you know, I'm all about cookouts. I'm all about just yeah. one, not having to do all the labor myself because I, this is my job. I like write cookbooks and uh, yeah. recipes. So I'm not trying to be like in the kitchen all day, but you know, I, I think, in this moment, especially over the pandemic and shelter in place, I, I think it's important, you know, one of the things that's been so um, hard for me, and I think a lot of people is just community and mm -hmm. not, not having the opportunities that we had uh, pre-COVID to just gather with people and hang out. And so I think you gotta get it in where you fit it in, where you fit in, like even in my own family, we did a lot of alfresco dining throughout the pandemic mm -hmm. because we're like, if we're home and the weather's beautiful, let, why not? eat outside you know yeah. created our little outdoor living room and we would eat out there often and cook out there i'd be doing a lot of cooking out there 
And um, I think any opportunities that we have to just gather with our family, friends, and community, um, we should do it. And it doesn't take a lot. It doesn't have to be like well thought out, planned weeks in advance. It could be impromptu and you just got to get at it and then just like build with your folks. Yeah, absolutely. No, cookouts are awesome. I mean, barbecue, Southern meat is like barbecues, but cookouts, I just love the intimacy of getting together with family and it's just, it's very low key and it's, it's very conventional. It's very easy. Like, it, yeah, that's definitely both. But yeah, I'm, I'm a big cookout fan too. I can't even lie. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan. <laughs> um, one of the things I wanted to ask was, so, you know, Vegetable Kingdom, Afro-Vegan, Black Food, which one would you recommend to someone who isn't quite comfortable in the kitchen, like someone who's newer and mm. is trying to learn some things? Great question. And I have two of them in front of me. We have the <laughs> other one in the office, but I haven't no. been in the office. <laughs> definitely, definitely Vegetable Kingdom. I feel like Vegetable yeah. Kingdom... It is um, structured in a way that makes it approachable for novices. And I really mm -hmm. wanted something that everyone could find their way into, whether you're like an experienced chef or just, you know, someone who's just getting into cooking. And I think that, you know, there's so many foundational recipes and, and tips and tools and cooking techniques that you can take from that recipe and apply elsewhere. So definitely, if, if you're looking to just like get some more nuts and bolts skills and encouragement for the kitchen, Vegetable Kingdom. If you're looking for like spiritual, intellectual, and um, culinary um, exploration and growth, then definitely Black food. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree a lot. Um, we, I remember when we first got um, Vegetable Kingdom in the office, um, some other staff members had gotten as Christmas gifts for family and stuff. So when it was time to write a blog on Vegetable Kingdom on our website, um, we were all racing to do it. Like, it was kind of like, who can type it up first? <laughs> and um, someone from, you know, one of my colleagues from not even the, you know, within my program, he's over the Cheese Coalition. He was like, I want to write it. Um, I've done some recipes from it. It's delicious. Uh, you know, like, my, my husband's uh, mother loves it, and we want to write a blog piece on it. So right. I think it's really um, definitely reaches out to so many people. And it really does offer that level of, you know, if you're kind of new in the kitchen, you can really get started and yeah. kind of, um, yeah, like get into the food scene. So I agree a lot um, with that. Um, another question I had, this is kind of more towards Black on, Black on Black Food, towards the, I think it was like the sixth chapter on, um, you know, self-care. Was it the sixth or the seventh? But it was towards the end. Um, Glenn oh, Lutz, the he has a writing. Chapter? Yes, yes, absolutely. So um, I really enjoyed um, Glenn Lutz's perspective. It was on page 240, oh, sorry, yeah, 247. And he was talking about, like, self-care being an active ongoing process of self-awareness and understanding that you're in the present. Um, I loved his room because uh, he really invites the reader to question, like, kind of things in your personal life. So, you know, kind of how it's structured. There's, like, multiple questions. And you can't just read through the, the writing without, like, actually taking the time to answer those questions for yourself. Like, I remember kept going back to that and being like, God, what is uh, you know, what is a routine in my life that I'm proud of, or, you know, like, just really taking the time to reflect. So it took me a while to actually, like, I kept on skipping over to that one, and then going back to it. But um, I wanted to ask you one of the questions featured in that. Um, it was, what routine in your life are you proud of? And, um, you know, when did you start doing that particular routine? So like a daily routine that you do? That's a great question. I'm going to tell you, well, it's not one routine. Well, I guess you could say the anchor. Um, so there was one routine that I think anchored me and allowed me to develop uh, a number of routines around my own personal, like, sustainability and health and growth. And mm -hmm. that was working out every day. Working out during, like, during shelter in mm -hmm. place. I, I should say, you know, during the week, five days a week working out uh, yeah. five days a week during shelter in place because, you know, that period I was here, I mean, I'm always here working unless I'm traveling, but my wife was now working from home instead of going into the office. Our children were distance learning here. So we were all at home. And I was very mm -hmm. clear that in order to, you know, 
feed and, and just like have like thriving mental and physical and spiritual health, I needed to be like working out, like being physically active on a regular basis. And so I started um, like, you know, doing cardio 45 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. it was great. I mean, one, just having a routine like that, I think is a great way to just kind of anchor your day to um, it was great physically. I mean, I feel like my heart health is better than it's ever been as an adult. I lost 20 pounds. And, um, wow. you know, awesome. one, one person, a, a good friend of mine is um, Mama Hutzman. He's a professor. He's a chair of the um, sociology studies at Columbia. We well, actually is leaving and now he's going to be at UVA. But he, he once told me that, you know, one of his mentors had told him that, like, when you start with the body, it'll lead you. And so if you start with like a regular, like just physical routine, then that will like open up growth and positivity and all these other areas of your life. And I truly feel like that. I feel like that was a start and all these other things started to just like, just blossom. And so that was the beginning. But then um, I like, you know, this year I was really missing working out in the community. So I started doing um, CrossFit, which I love sure. bringing the weight training. Okay. So, you know, doing my CrossFit, uh, eating cleanly, uh, getting good sleep, hydrating, and positive mental attitude. Like, everything started, like, my inner life is the most important thing to me. And, and everything, all the abundance and the, the, the blessings that I have in this physical world are because of the inner work that I do. So um, that's what it's all about for me. Yeah, absolutely. No, I love that you mentioned working out because I kind of just got personal note, but I just got back into working out. <laughs> and now I'm doing my morning like jogs. And I used to like, you know, have friends that would do that and be like, Oh, my gosh, like, you know, I was more like implementing workout into my daily life. So walking to work or, you know, kind of doing things like that, walking to the grocery store, carrying my groceries back. But um you know, once I started doing the morning jogs, like who would who would have thought that like it would actually impact my day so much? Like, mm -hmm. you know, going into work, it kind of changed my mentality on, you know, instead of waking up and being like, oh, you know, I kind of wake up now and I'm like, all right, let's just get this jog over with. And then I complete it and I'm like, oh, I'm energized. Let's, let's get ready for the day. So it, yeah. it definitely does have like a huge impact. Like, and it seems so simple. It's so easy but it's like mentally fighting through it to actually do it. And, and yeah. that's what makes such a huge difference. Yeah. And then so. once you develop that routine, it just becomes a part of just how you move through the world. So. Yeah. Like I feel like on days that I don't do it, I feel impacted more, you know, like I, I feel like that, that sense. So that's, I love that you mentioned that because it's something that I'm back into doing so you you saying that just kind of reaffirms that I'm doing a good thing so nice. keep at it Brian that's, <laughs> that's good <laughs> I love it. um I, I just have a few more questions but because I want to take up more of your time I know we're almost getting close to five so um let me choose wisely um one thing that I want to mention is the playlist on here is pretty great like I love that um, it really bridges kind of like older generations and younger generations together. Like, you know, like you could definitely be in the kitchen and just like add all the songs to a playlist and just like be cooking along in the kitchen with like family members of any age and they would still probably like jam out to it. So um, I was, the question I had was, um, what is something that we can learn from our African-American ancestors about healthy and sustainable living? uh eating in season <laughs> i think one of the yeah. problems with our industrialized food system is that we can access anything at any time of the year you can get strawberries in the dead of winter you can get um whatever whatever you want and and so i, I think it's important to listen to the wisdom of the earth and eat um in accordance right um in the summer when it's hot and we're sweating um ideally a lot more we need to be hydrating more and we need to, you know, that's when the earth is producing things with lots of water, like watermelons and tomatoes and mm -hmm. other fruits and vegetables. And then, you know, in the winter time, 
we should be eating things that are more grounding and warming. And so that's when you're getting like root vegetables and tubers. And we should be eating those things in soups and stews. I mean, you know, I, I, I believe that it's important. And, 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 you know, before in our industrialized food system, people had no choice. They had to eat what was in season or what they might, you know, can pickle mm -hmm. or like preserve. But the, the majority of what people were eating was, was what was available at that moment. And I think that we need to get back to that ethos because it's easy not to now. But I think when you tap into eating locally and seasonally and sustainably, then it puts you more in touch with things like the natural rhythms of the earth. And so I really want to encourage people to do that. I agree so much on that because um, I feel like that's something that I'm always thinking about when I'm at the grocery store and I'm shopping for ingredients. You know, they may have something like, um, you know, avocados, you know, that are definitely out of season, but because they were shipped, that's how, you know, we were able to have access to them. But it's just, I, it, I don't, maybe I'm the only one who thinks like this, but I'll just be at the grocery store and I'm like, ah, those aren't in season, so they won't taste too good. You know, like I'm thinking about the flavor. And so I'm like, no, I'm not going to waste my money on that because it's not going to taste good because it's not in season. Like, <laughs> that's like automatically where I go. And, you know, that's what our African, you know, heritage, that's what our ancestors relied on. You know, that's how they actually maintained a very healthy, um, um, predominantly plant-based diet because they did rely on the local produce and eating seasonally. So um, I think it's really important that we kind of connect back to that and, you know, think about that as consumers, um, you know, um, how can we, you know, kind of eat at a more healthy seasonal diet because it, it's kind of weird that we have so much access to things that definitely and it's like you buy them they're expensive and they taste bad of course because they're not in season so it's, it's a little bit of a waste of money at the same time too mm -hmm. um but i'm going on a tangent here um let me go on to my next one um did a little digging, but I know in high school, that's when you discovered kind of food activism. Is that true? Like that's kind of how you first got involved in plant-based eating. I was curious, um, was there like a very important figure in your life or a spiritual mentor that you used as inspiration to kind of feed into your food activism? Yeah, well, it was, um, I mean, it was a little after high school because that journey started then, but I'd say in college, when I discovered mm. the work of um, Dick Gregory, the comedian and social justice activist, yeah. and his um, book, Cooking with Mother Nature, I think that that was one of the the major, you know, just he, and because I loved everything about just the way that, you know, he shows up because he's has a deep uh, command of the content and he knows a lot about mm -hmm. nutrition and health, but he's a comedian. And so I think that he's so brilliant at using humor as a way to talk about these issues. And I think, you know, it's, it's, these are serious issues. You talk about like what people eat, it's very personal. People feel like, you know, stay off of my plate. And I think the levity <laughs> that he brought up with, um, is, is really inspiring. And so I, I strive, <laughs> even in my more strident, like <laughs> political moments, I think um, ideally just across the board, I strive to have that kind of like, um, bring that type of levity and humor to this work because i think um so often when you talk about food people are conjuring up you know they have the images of like the finger wagging nannies and that is just that people are turned off by that so mm -hmm. yeah and i know that you even talk about that in the book um it was one of our advisory board members um frederick opie he has like a piece on that and black food i was looking for the page two seconds ago but yeah it it definitely talks about that so that's so cool yeah um what else oh this is uh kind of um the last like actual question of course it's probably gonna be a follow-up one but um can you share a cooking or nutrition tip for um your readers and you know fellow listeners that you incorporate in your day-to-day -day life uh huh cooking or nutrition tip? Uh, I mean, I, I guess, I don't know if you want to look at it as a nutrition tip, I would say um, take a multivitamin because yeah. the reality is that so much of 
I mean, whatever. Like, if you're lucky enough to live next door to a biodynamic farm where you know that the swell is hella healthy and rich and that the nutrient density of the vegetables are off the chart, then maybe you don't need to. But, you know, the reality is that for most of us, the soil has been so depleted of nutrients that even if we are eating, like, organic foods, um, especially if they're from the supermarket, they may not be giving you all the, the vital nutrients. And nutrients. So I, I think it's just on principle, it's, it's a good idea to take a, um, a, a, and not, you know, I, whatever, do your research, but uh, the multi, yeah. So I'm not a physician. So this is not medical advice. <laughs> my my yeah. sister is a physician. So <laughs> holler at her if you want that, but I am not. So this is just personal <laughs> and anecdotal. Um, but I will say that, you know, um, yeah, like, I think it's a good practice for me to take a multivitamin, even with my very intentionally like plant centered, healthful diet that I like to think that I have, um, just to ensure that, you know, because of our um, soil that's been so wrecked that I'm, I'm getting everything that I need because, you know, we, we know that people are all suffering from all types of nutritional deficiencies, deficiencies. So that's just a way to kind of like help catch some things. So, yeah. No, it was so pretty good. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I take um, these gummy vitamins and honestly, like, I, I feel like I'm, I'm just doing it just for the taste because they're like candy. <laughs> I was like, oh, they're good for you, but they're, say, they're distracting. <laughs> I know about those, but what I was going to say is um, I take um, whole foods um, diet or um, supplements. So they mm -hmm. actually are made from like full spectrum whole foods. So anyway, if you can look, get you a multivitamin that's a whole foods multivitamin. So, <laughs> <that's it. laughs> so yeah, that'll do a difference. Awesome. Well, um, yeah, so that was kind of the last question that I had. Um, I want to say congratulations for Fur Color Books. Um, super excited. Um, really good to see um, your face on that project, to be honest. Like, um, you know, and keeping up with the work that you do. I was wondering um, if you could give us, like, a sneak peek on, you know, the future pro projects that you plan on, you, you know, like, working forward with um, Fur Color Books. Like, what what's going on there is there anything that you sure. want to give us a sneak into or yeah i mean but. we're we're rolling we have acquired about three books so far we're on the cusp of acquiring a couple oh, that's more. Exciting. um initially we'll be mostly publishing cookbooks and food related books because that is my wheelhouse however as the list unfolds i i want to publish whatever i'm excited about whether it's poetry or personal development, self-help, or prescriptive nonfiction, um, lifestyle, art books. We actually acquired an art book. The second book that we required is this book oh. by uh, Brooklyn-based photographer, Adrian Burrill. So we're going to be publishing this book he's doing where he's capturing Black um, student life at campuses from Ivy League institutions to uh, trade schools across the U.S. So, yeah, you know, Four Color is fully rolling. We're excited about not just publishing some brilliant books from diverse voices, but also, um, you know, providing resources and tools for BIPOC people who are hoping to be more uh, apprised of what's happening in food media. So we're planning a Black Food Summit at the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco uh, for April, where we'll be bringing the people, bringing together folks from around the world, both IRL as well as virtually for uh, community building um, skill sharing and networking. So that's what Black Food's up to. That sounds amazing. Everyone stay in touch. That sounds really cool in April, the Food Summit. All right, yeah. And we can find information um, on the museum's website, right? The African Diaspora Museum in San Francisco on their website. They'll have more information on that. Yeah, so, go to my um, website or, you know, go to my website just to kind of generally keep up. But definitely about the Black Food Summit, you can go to my wife's website. And um, yeah, we're going to do it big. Come out. Come hang with us in the Bay Area. I know. I've never been to San Francisco, but that sounds so fun. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time and, you know, meeting with Old Ways, a small nonprofit. We really appreciate it. Um, we will continue to be followers of yours, of course, and keep up with all your projects and 
post about you on Facebook. Think of us as like that cousin that just cheers you on because that's mm. what we are. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we will continue doing. And um, just thank you so much for your time and being able to connect. Um, this is absolutely amazing. So is this book. So people go out to your local bookstores and get it. <laughs> Shop locally. And um, thank you so much. This has thank been you. great getting to meet you. Yeah, no, thank and you. And thank you, me. everyone, for joining, too. Thank yeah. you, um, all the listeners. So great and meeting so you. And so always. Yeah. Thank you for no, I just want to say so great meeting you. Thank you for your um, awesome yeah. questions. And, um, you know, once again, I said at the beginning of the conversation, but I, I really do want to reiterate that. I, I am such a fan of the work that Always is doing. Um, I feel like many of the talking points that you all have, we're so aligned and I'm always sending people your way. So y'all keep doing what you're doing. Think of me and think of Four Color <laughs> as the cousin who is over on the sidelines cheering you all on. So thank you. Yes, all right. Well, thank you. Ah, gosh, I want to cry. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, and you have a good night. Everyone have a nice night. And thanks for tuning in. Peace. Bye.